morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on Wednesday, June 7th, 2017. I am Dave Biddle, and I'm very happy to be joined by Steve Hellwagon. Steve, um, obviously the topic of today's show, who is going to be the next basketball coach at Ohio State? Let's just cut to the chase there. Do you think that there's a leader right now? Obviously there's a short list, I'm sure. Do you feel like there is a leader in the clubhouse at this point or no? Well, I have a source, and I can go into some background on him. Uh, he's a guy who works within our network at 24-7, and he's very well connected to a guy who used to work in an athletic department and also uh, on the media broadcasting side of this. And there was one coaching change recently where he was out in front of everybody on what was going to happen, and I'm not going to say which one because then it would give it away perhaps, and I absolutely can't and don't want to do that in this situation. So this guy to me has proven to be uh, a pretty good source, and he told me that he was under the impression that Chaka Smart uh, was the guy who Gene Smith had kind of pinpointed, and it wouldn't surprise him if it moves very quickly. I think that uh, part of the issue could be this is a state job and they may have to post it for two weeks before they fill it. But um, you guess it will be interesting to see if any coaches are spotted coming into Columbus or on campus or going through the Schottenstein Center or whatever it may be. Um, you think there will be a high-speed chase like there was with Thad Mata, with Andy Geiger driving Thad Mata around and reporters and having a high-speed chase on 315? For those out there that think I'm being facetious, that really happened when Thad Mata was being courted. You think, you think we're going to see something crazy like that again, like their high-speed chase uh, through Columbus? There was an incident that came up yesterday uh Somebody spotted, and it was actually a a friend of mine from my hometown of Circleville, Ohio, put a thing on Twitter noting that Chris Mack had put his house up for sale. Now, and and man, is it a nice house, too. $1.3 million house on a golf course uh, in Kentucky just across the river. And, man, that commute trying to get over that bridge every day has got to be a bitch. But at any rate, um, I... (laughs) I guess he's moving to another house down there, so let's don't assume he's the He's next upgrading. Guy. That's all that is. He's moving to a nicer yeah. golf course in the Cincinnati. That's all he's doing. Yeah, he's happy at Xavier. Yeah, that, um, so Shaka Smart, that's interesting to me. He obviously played college hoops close to Columbus at Kenyon. Um, talk more about that. Would you, if that does happen, do you like that? Well, I guess I do because I think he plays a style of basketball that kids today would love to play, which is up-tempo. And I think there have been a lot of people who have come into the Big Ten over the years and said, oh, we're going to push this, we're going to do that. But my experience is the Big Ten is a half-court basketball league. I mean, Michigan State gets as many fast-break points as anybody around in this conference, and even they're lulled into half-court games quite a bit. So I'm not sure stylistically, I mean, I guess, you know, force the tempo and, and whatever, but... Uh, so, yeah, I think he would be on, on that side, he would be good, but somebody else also pointed out that although he did take Virginia Commonwealth from the first four, which was in Dayton, the play-in game, and a funny story, I think they chumped USC by like 25 points in their play-in game in Dayton, and when that happened, I went into my bracket, and I made them, as a 12 seed, the winner over whoever it was they ended up beating as the five seed. I Unfortunately, I didn't take them all the way to the final four. <laughs> but, but, you know, that tells you right there the guy can coach if he was able to do that, take a 12 seed, a play-in 12 seed, all the way to the final four. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think there would be some excitement, but the flip of this is in the last four years he has not won an NCAA tournament game, although, uh, what, this past season they were 11-22 and 22 at Texas. So I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. And uh, I don't know how hard Texas would work to try and keep him. Do they have the uh, gumption? Do they have the – I mean, they certainly have the money. I mean, they're right there with Ohio State in terms of an endowment and everything else. They can do whatever they want. Um, Do they want to pay him – Four to five million dollars. He's making about three million right now. That model was making somewhere between three and four, we believe, uh, when he was fired. So, um, 
you know, does Texas want to match? And that's that's a good question. And again, it's so early in this process that, uh, you know, what happened way back when, I think it was the Jim O'Brien one when he followed Randy Ayers, was Andy Geiger. There were names all over the country that were rumored. Eddie Fogler, for one, at South Carolina, couldn't coach his way out of a freaking wet paper bag. He got a big raise in extension and they joked about it on ESPN how Andy Geiger was getting everybody in the coaching profession raises because, you know, they couldn't get anybody to take the job. So, And then Jim O'Brien, who was on the outs at Boston College, after winning the Big East Tournament Championship with Scooney Ben, and uh, he wanted to raise an extension and they wouldn't do it, uh, he was ready to walk away from B.C. and uh, Ohio State, at least for a while, caught lightning in a bottle with him. But... Uh, I think the timing is similar to the Mata hiring. Uh, O'Brien was fired in June, and Mata was hired three weeks ago in July and, and hit the road recruiting and, you know, eventually wrapped up uh, uh, Conley and Noden, and uh, the rest was history. Shaka Smart's an interesting name. That's one of the first names that came to mind when all of this went down. Um, another one that came to mind right away was Chris Holtman from Butler, and that's one that's picking up steam. I know Alex Gleitman, our colleague, posted something on the front row last night that he's hearing. Uh, right now, if he had to guess, he think Chris, Chris Holtman would be the choice. People are posting Chris Holtman's like overall career record, including his first few years at Gardner-Webb. When he took over there, they were like one of the worst teams in all of basketball. They were like... RPI yeah, was like in the 300s. So his first two years there, he only won like 11 games and 12 games, but he took over a terrible program. By year three at Gardner Webb, he won 21 games. And eventually he gets the job at Butler. In three years at Butler, Steve, Chris Holman is 70 and 31, took them to the NCAA tournament all three years, playing in the tough Big East, took them to the Sweet 16 this past year, this year, took them to the Sweet 16. Chris Holman, to me, he, am I, uh, uh, th- this has me intrigued, to say the least. What are your thoughts on Chris Holtman? I am very excited about that. Just from when I, when I, you know, I think, you know, Wikipedia, you could say what you want. Some of it's factual, some of it may not be, but uh, it is a good, quick source to find stuff really quickly. And I looked at his Wikipedia page, and if I'm not mistaken, Butler, in his three years there, has finished second in the Big East twice. I think this year and uh, two years ago, uh, they finished second in the Big East, I presume, to Villanova, which has just been a juggernaut in that league since they formed it, or re, you know, reconstituted it, I guess, you know, got rid of the football schools. But uh, it's a great basketball league, no question about it. And for Butler to be uh, second in that conference, uh, it says a lot. And not only that, uh, Dave, we know – uh, obviously, Butler, you know, in, in the last two or three years has beaten a lot of good teams outside the conference. I think they beat Purdue this past year and uh, have beaten any number of, of, of good teams across the country outside the conference. So, uh, you know, if it is Chris Holtman, I do not know all that much about him. Uh, I wrote a little blurb about him for our hot board, but I have to be honest with you, I wrote that in one hour sitting in a school cafeteria where my daughter was playing an open gym basketball thing, and and our publisher Dan Rubin and CBS and everybody were like, "Where is the hot boy?" <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, I'll sit down using the Wi-Fi here at the high school cafeteria and rip this thing through," and, and came up with ten names pretty quick. So, um, yeah, I, I that's think life as a journalist. It is. That's life as a journalist, right there. Ready to go anywhere. The, they were they, on that day. They were whipping me. I, I was the horse coming down the stretch. They they were whipping me for everything they could get. But uh, I think that uh, the way that day unfolded was just uh, absolutely amazing. But uh, never, I, I just never sensed that he was going to get swept aside like that. But you know, and we joked off the air. This is the fifth radio show I've done about this, and I, I don't want to go too deep into it. But just really quickly, I just think that. You know, uh, Jaquan Lyle walking away, that, that leaves a bad mark. Uh, Darius Baisley, the things he said, that left a bad mark. Trevor Thompson going pro without any hope of being drafted, it seems, that leaves a mark. You know, and then you couldn't get Mark Smith from Illinois, and Thad Mata flew out there to watch him play twice. Illinois had a coaching change. They didn't even have a freaking coach in place, you know, after Gross left, and, uh, 
you know, Underwood came in and snapped him up, and then uh, M.J. Walker, he, he chose to be the 14th player on scholarship at Florida State instead of the 10th player on scholarship at Ohio State where he could have named his number of minutes. They could not give playing time away. I think Gene Smith was intimately involved in all of these situations in terms of monitoring what was going on. How are we going to fill this roster, Thad? How are we going to fill this roster, Thad? How are we going to fill this roster, Thad? And he couldn't fill it. And when he couldn't fill it on Friday, I think he walked into the meeting and he may have seen despair. I don't even know what uh, to say uh, that he saw in Thad's eyes that he was done. He, I think he realized at that moment he was not going to uh, to, to be able to. In 20, 2018 is a class they can't trifle with. They have got to go out and get three or four of these best players in Ohio for this class, or this thing's going to be stuck in neutral for the next two or three years. So that's the long and short of it. That's why I think it happened when it did. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's moving forward at this point. Before I let you go, we've talked about Shaka Smart. we talked about Chris Holtman. Uh, let's talk about some other candidates that could be involved here. Um, I'm sure they're looking at just more than two guys unless Gene Smith already has a guy lined up, which doesn't sound like he does. Um, I, you know, I'm sure he has a, somebody in his mind who, who he likes as the favorite, but who knows if that will be reciprocated. Um, the, the name that keeps being bandied about in Columbus is Billy Donovan. I think that's a complete pipe dream. Address that and address maybe who you think could be a realistic candidate for this job that we haven't already mentioned. Well, if you see a for sale sign in the house next to Urban Meyer up on number six at Muirfield, <laughs> uh, you know, they coerce whoever lives in the mansion next to the mansion that Urban Meyer lives in, then uh, may, maybe they got a shot, and maybe Urban would uh, try and, and appeal to his old friend Billy Donovan. They were very close. Uh, you know, it was like a kinship down there with the national championship runs that those guys went on. I think uh, both of them won two titles in about a three- or three-and-a-half-year period down there. And they yeah, beating Ohio State. I, I covered you, and you did as well. I covered Florida beating Ohio State in a national championship game, like, just like a few months apart. Be just, yep. I said us. <laughs> beat, beat Ohio State in football, and then beat them in basketball, like, a few months later in the national championship game. Like, that was not fun. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Ohio State also went down there and played them in a non-conference game, and, you know, with Greg Oden and those guys, and got smoked 86 to 60 or something like that. But, uh yeah, I think Donovan and Donovan and Thad Mott are tight. Uh, I've seen them at events, you know, even though they coached against each other in that national championship game. They signed contracts and played at least two home and home series against each other since then. And, um, yeah, I just think that, you know, he's making six million with the Thunder. But the issue there is you're looking up at Golden State, which is poised to be a juggernaut for the next five to ten years, it looks like. And I, you know, you're not getting out of the West. You're not going to win a title at uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, you lost. You might only have one more year of, of Westbrook. I think Westbrook's probably just going to stay there one more year and then bolt. Yeah, he may go for greener pastures with the Lakers or some, you know, some kind of glamorous deal. Uh, you know, like Carmelo did maybe with the Knicks. Or who knows? But at any rate, uh, yeah, it's not. I mean, he's making six million dollars a year. Ohio State's probably not going to pay him that much money, although they're paying. Mata probably, as you wrote, close to $8 million to walk away. So uh, the money that these people are being, you know, being thrown at these people is crazy. John Calipari, you know, what does he make? Seven or $8 million a year and worth every dime of it. They're rebuilding Rupp Arena down there on his back. So, you know, and it's just, uh, it's quite an industry, uh, you know, quite a, Quite a profession. Uh, Thad Mata, you know, hung his hat on the fact he had integrity and always did things the right way. And I was joking with a, a buddy of mine that he's a big fan. He goes, "That's great, but I'm ready to start winning some ball games again." And uh, <laughs> I guess it's a balance that you have to uh, to, to walk in this uh, this industry. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting. But uh, you know, I I just think you know you look at this. Get somebody who is going to be an effective program manager. Get somebody who is competent. Get somebody who's going to hit the ground running with this Ohio class for 2018. Because because these guys, Cohill, Hunter, uh, uh, Goodwin, maybe Justin Irons if they get him back in there. Maybe even Basley if they get him back in there. Maybe Pete Dance. You know those six guys. You got to get four of them 
that can be the backbone of your program going forward. Great stuff, as always, from Steve Hellwag. I really appreciate the insight, Steve, and thanks to all the listeners out there for tuning into the show. I appreciate it. hope you have a great day. Let's hear some Buckeye swag, best damn band in the land.